This is something that people ask a lot, and this is something that people ask a lot because it's something that is complicated and difficult. Human beings really, really love sorting stuff. We love putting things into boxes and categories and labelling things. We love taxonomy. We like things to be organised. And history isn't organised. History is messy and violent and bloody and stinks of pee and doesn't brush its teeth and never combs its hair. Sounds a lot like me. And this is one of those big history being messy things is when exactly is the Viking Age? Because it's a messy thing, right? It's defined as a period where sea raiding is happening. Scandinavian people are leaving their homelands, they're leaving Norway and Sweden and Denmark, and they're raiding people in longboats. And that happens for a long time, but it happens in different places for different amounts of time. For example, in Scandinavia, a lot of places classify the Viking Age as ending in the year 1000, because that's when Iceland is Christianized, and so that's when being a Viking kind of stops being a career choice. In the UK, and especially in England, 1066 is used, because of the Battle of Hastings, which we'll talk about why that's a bad option. We're going to try and define the Viking Age with some nuance. Strap in. So the first kind of recognised report of a Viking raid is in 789, and that happens when some Norwegians, or Danes possibly, but probably Norwegians, sail up to the south coast of England, go to the Isle of Portland, and the local king there thinks that they're merchants, so he sends down his reeve, his local magistrate, to collect the taxes from them for import tax. They murder him, do a bit of pillaging, and then foxtrot Oscar back onto their boats. It's a Viking raid. In the UK, and especially in England, 793 is the start date. Look it up. Wikipedia it. Google it. 793 to 1066. The Viking Age. Okay? That's a very Anglo-centric way of looking at it, and it's also patently just inaccurate, because we know that a Viking raid happened in 789. So why is 793 even used? Well, it's used because that is when Vikings attack, pillage, and burn the monastery at Lindisfarne, which is on Holy Island, which is just here. Holy Island is amazing. Let me know if you've been. I love Holy Island so much. I've spent some time there. You can only get there over a causeway at low tide, so people, like, lose their cars if they try and get across at different times of day. It's a superb, really lovely, beautiful place. You can visit the ruins of the monastery, and this is the first classic, typical Viking raid, right? They turn up in longboats, they kill the monks, they burn down the abbey, they steal all the treasures, and then they leave with slaves and captives and, and treasure and booty, and burning buildings in the background, right? That is the typical Lord from the Fury of the Northmen protect us. But it's not the first Viking raid. But it's the first big, spectacular, typical one, right? Where the heathen Norseman attacks the defenceless Christian. That is the classic narrative of the Viking Age. But it's not necessarily the whole story. A year after that, the Vikings sail around in 794, and they do the same thing to the Mother Abbey on Iona, which is where the monks from Lindisfarne had come from, originally. That is kind of the big start of their expansion. But why are they expanding in this way? Why are they raiding like this? And there are two kind of schools of thought, and as usual with me, I think it's best if we combine some aspects of it. We know that being a Viking was a job effectively. Check out this video on why you don't have Viking DNA, if you're interested. And there's basically an internal and an external <clears throat> argument. And the internal argument is that Scandinavia is unifying, they have great crop yields, there may be an, a population boom, we don't have really much evidence for that, and this is causing all of these people in Scandinavia to want to explore. They're developing better ship technology, tacking, wide sails, wider than your actual ship, so that you can sail 24 hours a day, effectively. So you can explore further, you can trade harder, you can go longer distances and explore more. You can sail better in open water and that kind of thing. And then there's the external pull from their homelands. Bigger trade networks, especially with Islamic trade networks and the Frankish Empire expanding massively under Charlemagne. All of these things combine so that you have this perfect storm. And I think that it's basically a combination of the two. Let me know if you guys have any other thoughts as well in the comments. This is why we're here, to share information, right? So all of these combinations of factors are happening, and by the 790s, the late 790s, this raiding has 
moved even further west to Ireland, and by the end of the 790s, the Norse have established themselves in Dublin, and it becomes a large trading centre, a craft production centre, and it actually has a huge influence on the local culture. This is what we call Hiberno-Norse culture. And I'd love to make a video on that. Let me know if that would interest you guys. It's basically this mash-up, this amalgamation of Welsh and Irish and Norse and uh, Gaelic Scots um, culture that all combines into this amazing artwork from this period. It's, it's just gorgeous and glorious and deep and rich and wonderful. And that's basically them in the British Isles for a little while. They concentrate on Dublin and on Ireland for a couple of decades. Why? Well, the Welsh are managing to unite just enough to fight them off, the English are managing to unite just enough to fight them off, and the Scots are managing to unite just enough to fight them off. So, Ireland has a lot of infighting. It's an easier target. Charlemagne takes control and becomes Emperor of the Romans in AD 800, so for the next few decades, France is well defended. But in the 840s, all that changes, and the Vikings start to raid elsewhere again. England is a little more fragmented again, and in France they actually manage to sail all the way up the Seine, right the way up the River Seine to Paris. They loot Paris, and they only leave after their siege when they're given £7,000. 7,000... 7,000 livres of gold. Silver. Bum. <laughs> £7,000 of silver, um, and then they leave, and this kind of is what is going on. There's this cycle of Scandinavian, especially Norwegian, unification uh, allows people a lot more opportunity to get into their longboats. They travel, they raid, they come home. But raiding often happens in the summertime, as with warfare in the period, it's generally in the summer, and this is what we call the warm period. So... Temperatures are slightly higher, which means that you have a longer summer and a longer time to do your raiding. Perfect storm. In the 860s, the great heathen army appears in the north of England, sacks York. York becomes the Viking city in the north of England, uh, and if you go to York now, they're still definitely making lots of cash off that. It includes characters like Ivar the Boneless, you might recognise him from the TV show Vikings, and the great heathen army pounds the snot out of the Anglo-Saxons for the best part of five odd years. In 871, Alfred the Great pays them to leave Wessex, which is here. At that point, two-thirds of England basically has been ravaged by the Norwegians, the Vikings control most of England, and they winter in London in 871. In London. They just stay in London for months. This huge army just goes to London, sits there, till 872. And for the next 90 years, basically half of England is Danish, or Scandinavian, or Norwegian, depending on whereabouts in England you are. And it's called the Dane Law. And that's the Dane Law is quite famous, it's where England is basically under Viking control. That all comes to an end in the 950s, when Eric Bloodaxe, brilliant name, is kicked out. So Norse influence kind of wanes slightly, but then in 1016, King Knut takes control in England, and he's king of England, Denmark, and Norway. By now, Denmark and Norway are Christianized. He is a Christian king of all these three countries. So he's not really a Viking, is he? He's often called the Viking King of England, but he's not a Viking. He doesn't go a Viking. He doesn't go on sea raids. He's too busy being king of three flipping countries. So really, we could argue in England, the Viking Age ends before the year 1000, or just after the year 1000, before Knut takes control. Because by the time Knut is in control, the people doing the Viking raids would be his own people, and they would be committing treason against their king and fellow Christians. So 1066 certainly doesn't work. So why is it 1066? It's 1066 because that's when Harald III of Norway tries to invade, Harald Hardrada, and is kicked out by Harald Godwinson, Duke of Wessex. He's not a Viking. Everybody, Every article you read will be, you know the last Viking invasion of England, 1066, he's not a Viking. He's not there to go a Viking. He doesn't operate as a Viking. At one point, he is a Varangian for the Byzantine Empire. He's a mercenary soldier, a very high-class mercenary soldier, because he's also a king. But he is a legit king of a Christianized country in Europe in the medieval period. He's not a Viking raider. 
he is attempting to reassert Norwegian dominance in England. He's not just there to burn down a couple of monasteries. So 1066 just doesn't work, but it's good for the narrative, right? It sounds good. The last Viking king tried to evade England in 1066 and was pushed out by the Anglo-Saxons who were then destroyed by the Normans. But he wasn't a Viking. Speaking of the Normans, in 911, the Normans basically come to be. Rollo is a Viking war chief. He's defeated in battle by the King of France. Is it Robert I or is it Charles at this point? Editing Jimmy, put it there. Put the right answer there. And he, as part of his peace treaty with the Franks, is forced to convert to Christianity. So he converts to Christianity, he's baptised, he takes the name Robert, he becomes Count Robert of Normandy. He's given this land in the north of France, and in exchange for this land, he has to protect the north coast of France from Viking raids. So he goes from being a Viking to being basically an anti-Viking bodyguard for the French. And yes, there's some minor raiding, but also he encourages settlement. And Norse settlement in Normandy is very, very intensive for a while. Over the next couple of generations, they start to become less and less Norse and more and more French. This is always an argument that people make, is that the Normans were Vikings. And yes, initially, no, very quickly. In fact, a lot of the French comment in the time, in the time period just after Rollo on how French they're becoming, and a lot of Norwegians and Danes who come to visit complain at how French all these Normans are becoming, and you get them having names like William and Robert and Godfrey instead of Eric and Rollo and Ulf. So another good illustration of this is French and even Norman French only has around 150 loanwords from Old Norse. English, modern English, has more than 400. So they're not that influential in terms of the culture there. The Normans by 1066 are fully, basically, Northern French Christians. They're not Vikings anymore. So when does the Viking Age end in France? Well, it kind of depends. We don't have a written record of when exactly the last Viking raid happened, but it was probably during the 900s. It was almost certainly before the year 1000. And this is part of the problem, is nobody wrote it down. Meanwhile, in Ireland, all of these Norse people are still there, it's still Hiberno-Norse, and it's actually strongly Norwegian in a lot of Ireland until 1171, when the Normans and their native Irish allies smash through a lot of the Norse, and a lot of the Norwegian influence is lost. So in some places in Ireland, 1171 is given as the end of the Viking Age which just doesn't really work because raiding wasn't really happening anymore. So maybe you have a different end date for when the Viking Age happened, and I'd love to hear it in the comments. And this kind of general history video is something I really enjoy because it's challenging. You have to really think about it and look at all of the nuances. I hope you enjoy watching me sort of trying to tackle this stuff as well. If you do, please do like and subscribe. I, I'm, I really do appreciate all of the new people who've been subscribing and leaving wonderful comments. I'm trying to make this into more of a job, and you guys are helping it to happen, so thank you so much. I have a a little goal of getting to 50,000 subscribers soon, and with your help, hopefully I'll get there. Anyway, on with the show. So this is the big problem that I was talking about, is we use these arbitrary dates, like 1066, 1171, as an end to the Viking Age. But arguably, I could give you 1209 as the end of the Viking Age, because a group of Norwegian pirates loot the Isle of Iona again in 1209. They're not sanctioned, uh, they are effectively privateers. They're, to all intents and purposes, Viking raiders. They turn up from Scandinavia, they pillage, they loot, and then they leave. That's a Viking raid. But nobody would put 1209 as the end of the Viking Age in Scotland. That's just not what people would do. But I've just given you an example of how we could say 789 to 1209 is the Viking Age in the British Isles. But we go with 793 to 1066 because it fits a sexy narrative. It's a sexy narrative of it starts with the looting and burning of a monastery and it ends with three men fighting over the throne of England. And that is a film right there. You know, that is a screenplay waiting to be optioned. But historically, it's not true. That's not the Viking Age. And... It's difficult sometimes doing history, because history, like I said, is messy. 
but people really, really want it to not be. And if you tell them that it is, and that you can't give them these definitions in a box, they get disappointed. We give these things titles, and we give them titles like the early medieval, the high medieval, the late medieval, the Viking age, because at some point, you need to organise the library. You need to organise the notes. You just need to draw a line at some point. My own research has a pretty arbitrary line drawn on it, and the reasoning behind it seems pretty shaky to me, but it's just been accepted by everyone I've told it to. So, sometimes it just happens, and it is a symptom of academic research. But I really hope you enjoyed this, and I hope that this has given you some food for thought, and let me know what you think. Tell me when the Viking Age ended in the comments. I want to know. And thank you so much as ever for joining me. Dielchen Vaudiaun, in Waitheta, I'm a minna, and until the next time, who will am a draw. Bye for now. <laughs>